you guys. I am so excited to be here. And Don, I'm nervous too, so it's all good. We're all nervous together. So who, who here was able to come on Monday morning and hear Jason's talk? Okay, good, awesome. So I'm really excited because this morning I am going to talk a little bit more about my story versus how I was impacted by Jason's story. So if you were expecting more of that, come tonight. We are going to be talking together at an evening service, so just so you know. Uh, whenever Jason, 12 years ago, told me when he finally decided to tell me the truth about his secret life, I, let me just tell you, I mean, I was devastated. And I also, I was like, wow, you're really messed up. Oh, you, you are really broken. I mean, I was very judgmental towards him. And since then, I have realized how messed up I have been and am and how broken I am and how much I need Jesus. And so I just want, I just want you to hear that first and foremost, that er, whenever Jason told me his ugly truth, I really thought, wow, you're messed up and I'm perfect. So as you hear my story this morning, just like Jason asked on Monday, I am just asking that this could be a shame-free zone and a judgment-free zone, okay? You'll be bouncing your story off of mine, and, and I just want you to not judge yourself and not live in shame sitting here as you hear my story. I was thinking about if I were a freshman in college and I was listening to someone that had my story, I would self-protect. I would kind of start to build up a wall while they were talking because I wouldn't want it to hit me here. And so I'm just asking for each of you to just take down that wall this morning and let it marinate in your soul. Okay, so um, in the last six or so years, I have realized that in my growing up years, I had two really core wounds that, that have really affected a lot of the choices I've made. And here are the two core wounds. I felt invisible, and I also felt unchosen. So let me just explain those two things to you first and foremost. I felt unchosen as a child because I never had a boyfriend. In middle school, high school, I was never asked to homecoming, which was a huge deal in my community. I, I never had a boyfriend. I felt completely powerless to change that, I could, that a boy did not want me. I remember, you know, all of my good friends had a boyfriend, and I remember my mom, whenever I'd have my girlfriends come over, and I felt like the second thing she would ask is, so, Dory, Jennifer, who are you dating? And they would say, and I, and I just sat there thinking, oh, this is really important, and I don't have this. And so I felt really unchosen by the time I went off to college. I also felt really invisible as a child. Again, I could not put words to this when I was 18. I have two brothers, and my older brother, he's just less than two years older than me, and he was this amazing athlete. He was a football player, and if any of you are from Texas, you know football is a huge deal. He was really popular, he was good looking, and I was none of that. I felt ugly. I wasn't a star athlete, and I, I truly lived in a shadow. And last night I was talking to Jason about this, and I just want to mention this because this so, just the word picture of, of how the disparity between Clay and I. When he turned 16, and I'm happy to go into more detail at noon for the luncheon. When he turned 16, he had enough money to buy a Porsche 911. It was an older car, but still, it was a Porsche 911. When I turned 16, 
I didn't have much money at all. I, I, I don't know what I did with it, but I just didn't have much. So I inherited my father's Chevrolet Caprice Classic. Now I understand you guys might not know what a Chevrolet Caprice Classic is. Just Google it on your phone. It was a 1991 Chevrolet Caprice Classic. You guys, it's like a boat. I'm serious. It's like a, you know, a police cruiser type car. Had a bench seat in the front and in the back. And so, I mean, even just that, what I drove when I turned 16 and what my older brother drove, there was such a disparity. So, what happened was as I was feeling so unchosen and so invisible, and again, I didn't have the words for it then, but I started to hate myself. There was self-hatred. I hated my freckles. I hated my blonde eyebrows and my blonde eyelashes. And I wanted to look different. And so my junior year of high school, I had my wisdom teeth taken out. No big deal. Maybe. And I uh, had some complications. And so I went back to school, and I had lost maybe three to five pounds. And I wasn't, I wasn't overweight to begin with, but I had more than one friend say, wow, Shelly, you look really good. Have you lost some weight? And for the first time, or one of the first times, I felt significant, I felt powerful. It was something that I had control over. And so I continued to not eat and to, to limit what I was eating in order to continue to lose weight. People really started to notice me, and I felt important. And so the next thing I'm going to say, I want you to know I'm not proud of it, so I'm asking for you not to judge me. But I remember walking into a room, I would do this all the time, and I would kind of assess all the other gals in the room and see if I was the thinnest. And if I was the thinnest, it would give me enough power, if you will, willpower, to skip the next mill. And if I wasn't the thinnest, I would punish myself by skipping the next mill. I don't know if any of you guys can relate to that. So I went off to college and I started to wear this mask. And it was this mask of being the thin girl. I remember in my dorm room, the girls were like, wow, you have so much self-control. And so I was wearing this mask and it became my identity. Another connection that I've made recently is this. As I started to get thinner, I lost my breasts for the most part. And what I know today is there was significance even in that. Because remember, as a child, I thought, gosh, if, if I could have been a boy like my brother, maybe I would have felt significant. And so by becoming thinner and thinner, I felt more like a boy. So I met Jason my freshman year of college. And what I can tell you is we were so great for each other, but in such a dysfunctional way. Yes, I had my eating disorder that I was holding closest to my heart. And unbeknownst to me, he had something that he was holding closer to his heart. And so we kind of kept each other at arm's length, and it worked really well for us, OK? Well, at this time, my freshman year of college, I, as I was wearing that mask of being the thin girl, and, and one more thing with Jason, he chose me. Finally, someone chose me, right? Finally. And so that was huge in our relationship. That was huge for me. It started to fill up that core wound within. So I started to fear that I was going to gain weight, and I realized, who would I be if I started to gain weight my freshman year of college? Because I was known as the thin girl. I would be a nobody again. And so then I started to fear, oh no, what if I gain weight? And so life really started to revolve around, I can't gain weight, I can't gain weight. And so what once gave me a lot of control started to spin me out of control. 
I started to isolate, I started to hide, and like I said, I started to lose control. And I became exhausted of feeling cold and weak, and I know that there's people in this room who can relate to that, who have skipped a mill, and they're feeling weak, and they're feeling cold, and they've done it for so long, and they're exhausted of living this way. I remember in college, there were days that I would only eat an apple a day, or a box of raisins, and that's all I would have all day, because I was so afraid of gaining weight. But my body wanted food badly, and so as I started to spin out of control, I started to binge. And so I would starve myself for three or four days, and then I would binge. And I remember going down to this campus quickie, buying a loaf of bread, going back up to my dorm room, and standing at the window, and just stuffing my face, stuffing my mouth with bread, and looking out the window and wondering, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? I felt so ashamed, and I felt so alone, and I knew I couldn't tell anyone because I was so ashamed. So this behavior continued for the next couple of years, the starving myself and then binging. I went to um, grocery stores, and, and would buy food, and I ended up stealing food from grocery stores. I also worked at a coffee shop where I would sneak food. And so a big part of my recovery has been making amends for those things that I did. So Jason and I ended up getting married after we had dated for five years. And those first couple of years, I was still in the thick of my eating disorder. However, I started to cope in other ways as well. And our marriage was not good, it was not healthy. But did I tell anyone? Did I ask for help? Absolutely not. I, again, I felt so alone, so ashamed, and I kept it all in. And so, I started to make a lot of money at what I did for a living. And so I started to wear this mask of being the, the physical therapist. I was a physical therapist. And I did the same thing that I mentioned earlier. If I started to feel inadequate, insignificant in a situation, in my head, please don't judge me, I'd be like, eh, I'll probably make more money than you. Oh, I mean, I hate that I'm even saying that, but it's true. And that's how I started to soothe myself. So Jason, one night, said, told me that he had almost cheated on me. And that's when another point where my life really started to unravel. And he didn't want to talk about it. He said, what's in the past will stay in the past. We need to move forward. And I was like, OK, yeah, you're right. Yeah, let's do that. Let's move forward. And so I processed it guess what, on my own, alone. And I thought, you know, this is my fault. If I were sexier, this would not have happened to me. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to change who I am, and I'm going to become a sexy wife, and I'll save my marriage. And so I started to wear another mask of being the sexy wife in order to save my marriage. I also forgave Jason very quickly, because isn't that what all good Christians do? We're just gonna, let's just forgive real quick, right? So nine months later, I realized I was so bitter and so resentful towards Jason. I had not forgiven him. My heart needed major work. And I knew I couldn't continue to live my life this way. And so one thing led to another, and I confronted Jason, and I demanded for him to tell me the truth. And a couple of days later, he came to me, and he was ready to tell me the truth. And it was a God thing. A couple of weeks before that, he had hit his rock bottom, and he had asked God to take this away, and he heard God say, okay. And at that point is when I started to realize, I cannot forgive you. 
I need to know the truth. I need to know what I'm forgiving you for. And so Jason chose to tell me the truth. And it wasn't just one woman, it wasn't just one affair, it was a 10-year sexual addiction. It started with pornography and masturbation, it ended with affairs, both before we got married and while we were married. I was devastated. Let's see if I can get it to the next. Okay, I was devastated. I thought Jason chose me but he didn't choose me. Well, maybe he kind of chose me, but he also chose a lot of other women. And so I love this graphic. Is it coming up? Yeah, thanks. Of the grief process. (laughs) What we want grief to look like and then what it actually looks like. And in the essence of time, know that on the right-hand side, that's what my life was like for about the next three to six years. It was messy, it was ugly. There was sweetness in there too, but it was messy. I'd come up for air. I mean, God just, he saw me through. And so six years into my process, into that healing process with Jason, I hit another rock bottom. Jason's like, you bounced a lot. I would hit a rock bottom, and then I'd hit another rock bottom. And I came to this place where I realized I did not trust anyone. I held everyone at arm's length. I was doing life on my own, trying to do it on my own, and not in community. And I made this vow. I realized I had made a vow. God, I don't trust you. If you've allowed this to happen in my life, and what I mean by this, I mean the affairs, and the pornography, and the masturbation. I don't know what else you might allow to happen in my life. I'm not gonna trust you. I'm not gonna pray to you. I'm not gonna trust you. So just as I realized with forgiveness that I could not continue to live my life with a bitter and resentful heart, I came to this rock bottom where I realized I couldn't live my life not trusting, and especially not trusting God. And so one night, I invited Jesus back into my life and I asked him to completely restore me. I started asking for complete healing and complete wholeness. And it's as if he said, okay, then it's time that we work on you. And so that was six years ago. And so that's what the last six years have been, is me working on my self-image, my body image, working on these masks that I have been wearing and removing those masks, working on insecurity, working on jealousy. I mean, the list goes on and on. So in these last eight or so minutes, I wanna give you guys some practical tools that you can just take with you today. These are just some things that, that I know today standing here that have helped me on this part of my journey. I want you guys to know that it's just been in the last five or so years that I've even admitted that I had an eating disorder. Before that, I was like, I don't need to mention that. No, Jason, no, I don't need to mention that. But that's been a part of what the last five to six years has been, is getting really honest about my story. And in that, that's where the restoration has occurred and the healing has started. Okay, so the first thing is, this is a process. Working towards complete restoration is a process, and I'm still on the journey. There was a part of me that was like, what, they want me to come talk about this? I am not there yet. I cannot be the person to stand up here and tell you guys what to do, because I'm still on the journey. I'm just not there yet. And then I'm like, you know what? I guess we're always on the journey, right? This is such a process. There's a quote about forgiveness that I wanna share with you guys, and I think it so relates to other aspects of our lives. The gal that, I I read a book called Strong Women, Soft Hearts by Paula Reinhart, and she says, forgiveness is both an event and a process. It's one big yes, followed by many little yeses as the months and years roll by. And isn't that the truth with forgiveness? I mean, I've lived that out with Jason. 
but it's also the truth with, with seeking complete restoration. It's saying yes once, and then it's also continuing to say yes as the months and years roll by. Second, it's about intimacy. And a lot of times when I say intimacy, people think sexual intimacy, and that's not, I mean, that is a form of intimacy, but I'm talking about more emotional intimacy, or maybe intellectual intimacy, spiritual intimacy. I mean, there's a lot of different forms of intimacy. So think of intimacy as intimacy. The definition of intimacy is fully knowing another and also being fully known. And I feel like that has been a huge part of the last six years, is me letting other people in and fully knowing me. But I think it starts with self-intimacy. It starts with us getting to know ourselves. How can we let others in if we don't even know who we are? And so here are four questions that you can ask yourself. Again, just practical. What do I think? What do I need? What do I feel? And what do I want? And practicing getting to know yourself better. I believe that as we get to know ourselves better and we're able to shine the light on our darkness, it gives other people courage to say, hey, me too. Yeah, me too. I know where you're coming from, me too. And as we live in true intimacy, and I think there's one other thing in there is acceptance, true intimacy and acceptance, that that shame and guilt, it just starts to evaporate. Third thing is, there we go, accepting and loving the fact that we are each uniquely made. And so a lot of the last couple of years have been coming to terms and working towards accepting the fact that God gave me freckles. I, and I know that sounds funny, we're talking about freckles, people, you know, but I, I hated my freckles, and I thought, when I was in high school and college, I thought if maybe I could just tan a little bit more, all my freckles would turn into one big freckle. You know what I mean? And I'd be nice and tan like my brothers. It never happened, I just got more freckles. <laughs> and then my eyelashes and eyebrows, they're blonde. You can't see them. It's true. <laughs> but that's how God ordained me to be. And so I wanna embrace that. That's, that's unique, not everyone has eyelashes and eyebrows you can't see. <laughs> and, there, and it's not just the physical things, it's, you know, it's God chose me to be, have a sensitive heart. Before I came up here, hearing what Donna was saying, I started crying. I was like, I can't go do this. I was like crying listening to her. But that's how he chose me to be. So it's about accepting and embracing that. And so I just challenge you today to think through, how did God make you uniquely? And how can you accept yourself in that and then also love those parts of you that are unique? And last, being intentional to encourage our friends. We're all going the same place. We're all going in the same direction. So when we see something that is unique and God-given, there's a girl here, Leah, that I know, and she is one of the most amazing encouragers I've ever met. And so for me to be able to tell that to her is huge for both of us. Words are powerful, and so I just encourage you when you see something in your friends that is unique and God-given, to share that with them. And it really can help combat the negative self-talk that we all struggle with. So in closing, I wanna share with you something that happened about three years ago. I was on a run and I was uh, about to talk to some men. Jason was already at this church talking to them and I was going to go and share part of my story. And I said, ask God, God, what is it that you would like for me to share with them? And what I heard him say is, and, and please hear me say, I've maybe heard God speak like five times. I mean, not even this many times, so it was huge. 
I heard him say it was for your good. I don't want to be inappropriate, but I think I maybe like gave God the bird initially. I was like, what? You know what I mean? I was like, no, no, mm -mm." I went back to the hotel and I'll admit, I Googled from my phone, it was for your good Bible verse. And and it, it was the story of Joseph at the end of Genesis. And you guys probably know that story. I had never read that story three years ago. And so I read it, and it's an amazing story about forgiveness. And at the end of Genesis, Genesis 50, 20, Joseph says to his brothers, what you meant for harm, God meant for good in my life. And that has been the case for me too, and for you too. What Satan meant for harm, for me what Jason meant for harm, God meant for good in my life. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.